Hello, friends of South Aberdeen Baptist Church. So glad you're with us today, and we're continuing a series on the doctrine of last things, eschatology, and we're finding that Matthew 24 and 25, the lengthiest prophetic segment of the entire New Testament outside of the book of Revelation, is a fantastic bridge between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy. So we're looking at this segment uh, taught by the Lord Jesus two days before his crucifixion. And if you want to get a, a sense of the first eight verses of Matthew 24, you might wish to watch the message that I produced um, in the middle of the week uh, preceding this message, which is uh, scheduled for uh, availability on Facebook on Sunday, May 17th, 2020. So I hope you might want to review and get a, a picture because what we're doing is giving a overview of uh, Jesus's teaching, Matthew 24 and 25, and we're using a analogy or a um, memory cue to grasp what Jesus had to say. And you're going to discover that there is a, uh, uh, a, a parallel between Matthew 24 and 25 and those things that are written in the book of Revelation uh, from chapter 6 all the way through uh, chapter 20 at verse 10. And in that segment, uh, you have a lot of data, a lot of information about the future uh, that uh, can be avoided in your own personal experience through faith in the promise of everlasting life, but which nonetheless some people who have rejected that free gift will experience as they will have missed the rapture of the church and they will find themselves in the midst of the outpouring of God's wrath on planet Earth during a seven-year period prophesied by the prophet Daniel in chapter 9 of his writing that uh, gives a very brief summary of this period. Now, Jesus gives more about this period than Daniel does in Daniel chapter 9, but the book of Revelation fills in a lot more of the detail. As challenging as it may seem, because in Revelation there's an, a lot of symbolic imagery going on that often throws people off the track and gets them going down rabbit trails instead of being able to say this is a comprehensive package deal that Jesus gave a shorter version of in Matthew 24 and 25, which is even shorter in Daniel chapter 9. I hope you'll understand the unity of Scripture and you'll appreciate that God has given us what he has given us, not to be uh, puzzled over, but to be studied, meditated upon, dwelt upon, and allowed to become a comprehensive unit of biblical prophecy that can change your life here and now in the present in a very dramatic kind of way. When your life is filled with hope, and you know that God has a plan and you understand some of the detail that he has given us, he's given it to us for our edification, for our building up and uh, encouragement and comfort, uh, both for those of us who will be raptured and then during the tribulation period of seven years, to help those who are in that situation, having rejected the free gift of everlasting life during this current time of grace, they will have comfort and direction in the midst of tribulation and then great tribulation. So I hope you're willing to give a listen to this idea 
that God wants you to know some facts and not just to sit around and puzzle and say, well, I'm a pan-millennialist or whatever, and it's all going to pan out in the end. God has given us specifics, and he, want us, he wants us to think about his revealed word. Yes, there are hidden things, mysterious things, but the things that he's given us in Scripture are the things that are available to us. Some of you know that verse in Deuteronomy 29. Uh, that talks about the hidden things and the mysterious things. But there, that same verse in Deuteronomy 29 talks about the things that are made known and that you can know much of what God has in store. He has things in store for the Gentile nations of the world. He has things in store that he has specifically addressed to the physical seed and descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he has a message for those of us who are members of the universal body of Christ known as the church. The Gentiles, the Judeans, or the people who are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, often called the Jews, and then the church, God's people in this present age of grace. Now, here you see a, a picture on the screen of Jesus meeting with his disciples, this Olivet Discourse. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's teaching his disciples. He's giving them uh, his summation of things to come, and they're asking him questions. It's a frequently asked questions time, a question and answer. And it's interesting to see the development of how Jesus responds to the specific questions about uh, when will these things be and what will be the sign of their coming. And just like in a uh, typical press conference when people are asked questions, it's often two questions or a double question. And the responder to those questions asked by the news folks are usually the second question is answered first, and then, oh, would you remind me, what was the first question you asked? Uh, Jesus, of course, doesn't need his disciples to remind him what their first question was, but he gives them an answer to the second question in Matthew 24, and then he comes uh, toward the end of chapter 24, to the first question that they asked about exactly when these things will be. And of course, his answer is going to have to do with the fact that only the Father in heaven knows precisely the day and the hour. And Jesus had subjected himself to a voluntary non-use of that one piece of information about the day and the hour of his re triumphal return to earth so that he would honor the will of his father in teaching his followers what God did want them to know and what he didn't want them to know at that time for their good and uh, their good and for their blessing by God through the outflowing of the activities and events of the future things to come all right so let's take a look next of how we're presenting this as a uh, memory cue to help you grasp the development of matthew 24 and 25. here you go Ma uh, on the screen and i will make this available to you midweek this next week uh, with the next lesson that will will come through with uh, a description of what I'm calling the halftime presentation uh, of a uh, imagining a football game, like a, I'm, I'm thinking of a Super Bowl game where sometimes there's kind of a, uh, a raunchy halftime presentation, if you will, please, as my personal view of what happened at the Super Bowl this year and what often happens. Uh, wardrobe malfunctions uh, <laughs> considered as well. <sighs> if you'll see on the screen, 
item number two, Matthew 24, 15 to 20. That's what we'll get to uh, in the coming week. And what I'm uh, allowing to be thought of in parallel with a Super Bowl game, the halftime presentation that I was just giving you a little hint about. And you'll find out what that is, or you can read ahead, Matthew 24, verses 15 to 20, to see what that halftime show is all about. And then in uh, the week to follow, we'll have the second half of the game, the Great Tribulation, the worst of the seven years, the last three and a half years as they unfold. And then in overtime, in Matthew 24, verses 29 to 35. And then the week after that, uh, we will get to Matthew 24, starting at verse 36, where we'll have a, uh, an unusual uh, description of a pregame show uh, of the whole game, something that pertains to those who live before this seven-year time period with a first half and a second half. The pregame show uh, made available to us uh, before that game unfolds, but from our um, reading of Matthew 24, you'd say, well, this comes after, but it's really an opportunity to grasp what we can do in the present to be prepared for the coming of this these events and it'll bring up Noah and how people were unwilling to prepare to respond to the message of Noah and in that day of the great flood so much life was unnecessarily destroyed because of the hardness of the hearts of humanity well then we will be wrapping it up in a few weeks with Matthew 25, verse 14 to 46, which is the true post-game show with some lessons for all to learn by and the field judge's final call. And we'll see what that's about. It has to do with the judgment of the Gentiles, the sheep and the goats uh, separated. One on one side, one on the other. But that's coming up. Now, let's look at our passage for today, which begins where we left off. We had left off with Matthew 24, verse 8, where it said, All these are the beginning of sorrows. And we compared that to the Braxton Hicks contractions of a woman who is uh, pregnant. But then comes tribulation. And both of these words are used, and we'll get to the verse that shows where Tribulation can be a reference in other contexts to the final push for the birth of a nation in the case of the uh, nation of Israel being established and the kingdom of God brought to planet Earth in chapter 19 of Revelation, but uh, at the conclusion in an overtime of this uh, magnificent unfolding of God's um, predicted, prophesied things to come for planet Earth. This is all before what is called the new heaven and the new Earth. Uh, that's going to be down and it's not in the purview of Matthew 24 and 25. It is in Revelation uh, chapter 20, uh, beginning at um, verse 11, going all the way through Revelation um, uh, 22, the final chapter of the Bible. That's not in the purview, that segment from 20, verse 11, through chapter 22. That's not in the Matthew 24 and 25 segment, just to get you thinking ahead if you're really wanting to read through Revelation and make some correlations along the the memory cue of a first half, a halftime presentation, a second half, and then an overtime, really the second coming of Jesus, the uh, end of the 
Advent period of seven years when he comes to receive his church up into the sky and then the visible return at the end of those seven years. So the halftime presentation will be this next week, then the second half, and then the overtime, and then the pregame and the postgame show, and we'll get all the way through Matthew 24 and 25. But last time, uh, the message that's available to you on Facebook from uh, um, May uh, 14th and 15th in that area that was made available to you, uh, we had this final statement, these are the beginnings of sorrows, the, the initial contractions of the birth, and then the tribulation and the final push that will come to us but there's some tribulation and difficulty even before the great part of the final push. But it is comparable to the time when often the pregnant woman with her husband can go to the hospital and be in a labor and delivery situation, sometimes for, for 24 hours, a difficult time period of the final... Uh, delivery of a new life into this world. So all these things are the beginning of sorrows. We talked last time about the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, that are described in the um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 of the book of Revelation. But now uh, the portion that we're going to deal with today is... Uh, Matthew 24, verses 9 to 14, and that will have a correlation with Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, all the way through chapter 9, verse 21. So let's look at verses 9 to 14 in Matthew 24 kind of like the second quarter of the game, the uh, second portion of the first half, all right? Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And he is addressing himself to uh, those who have believed in the promise of everlasting life sometime after the beginning of this seven years of trouble and difficulty. And there will be difficulty, uh, for sure. And you can see what this difficulty will consist of, and then we'll see what some of the touchdowns scored by the winning team are, even in the first half, in the second quarter. Um... What are the difficulties faced by God's believing people uh, during uh, the second quarter or the second half, uh, uh, second portion of the first half? Second portion of the first half. Okay, well, you hang in there with me. What What is going on? Then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. Boy, if those aren't words that are currently being used in our society that make me feel like we're just in the warm-up period for what's going to happen during the tribulation, during the seven-year tribulation, people getting offended, people uh, finding that things that others do are... Um, uh, worthy of being, being considered hate. Uh, regardless of their motives, their actions judge them as having hate in their heart because of the nature of their behavior rather than uh, diagnosing, um, rather than uh, uh, looking at activities and judging people for what they do. There is uh, offense created simply because of 
other people's personal convictions. It's really a dramatic shift that's taken place in our society of late and will continue into this time period, I believe, of the great tribula of the tribulation. People getting offended because of what people believe, and they call that hate, regardless of what their activities are, they judge the hearts of people, and that's something we should not do. We don't know what's in everybody's heart. We can look at their activities and say that's wrong behavior. All right, verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Many voices of authority claiming to know the truth and and set the record straight. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Very sad. Uh, not all who have believed will persevere. But there is an interesting group of people, according to Revelation, uh, in chapter 6, verses 9 and uh, um, following, who are a part of a group of 144,000 individuals who get special protection, a seal from God, that does not allow them to be killed. This specific group of 144,000 representatives from 12 tribes of Israel, uh, 12,000 from each tribe, 144,000 all told. And they will be given the ability to endure to the end and they will be preserved. They will be saved and delivered through this amazing time of tribulation, and they will be responsible for a mission that is the taking of the good news of the coming kingdom of God uh, throughout the entire world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. The second advent of Jesus Christ in his visible form, coming down out of the skies with his bride at his side in conquering, conquesting fashion, establishing his kingdom for a thousand years. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. Now, we can preach the message of the kingdom that will be coming today, and we pray uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we speak about the kingdom and we delight in the fact that there won't just be an immediate split second taking away into glory and then we spend the rest of eternity away from planet earth. No, we are in the clouds, we're in the sky with the Savior who it doesn't say he goes back to heaven after he comes down and takes his bride. He's uh, veiled in the clouds of the sky above to uh, prepare his bride to return with him in conquest and victory to establish his wonderful kingdom for a thousand years. And meanwhile, down on earth, while great tribulation occurs and persecution, uh, hate crimes and convictions based upon, um, or judgments based upon convictions and offenses taken by many and false prophets. During that difficult time, there will be those who have been appointed to preach this gospel of the kingdom throughout all the world. And many Gentiles in the nations of the earth will believe the promise and many of them will die, but not the 144,000 who are sealed by God and protected throughout the entire time of the tribulation. They will endure to the end and be preserved through the time of the tribulation. 
I'm glad we can think about and talk about the kingdom of God to come now, because to me then, it becomes a great motivation to love the Savior, to persevere even in the present difficult time as we await the rapture of the church to be in the presence of the Savior. This is a grand and glorious time, and I hope you look forward to what God has in store at the end when we return with him as his bride to rule and reign together with him for a thousand years. It's going to be a glorious day. So this time with coronavirus uh, dominating the news and keeping us in our houses, let it be a time for meditation and thought, for reflection and evaluation of our own lives that we will be found faithful at the coming of the Savior. You'll hear a scripture verse shortly that is read by Mike Poitras from 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And it is an invitation to abide in him that when he appears, uh, we will not be ashamed that we will stand and be rewarded for our faithfulness uh, by his grace, by his mercy at work within us, not I, but Christ who lives in me, yes. But we can open the door to God's work within us as we walk with him, as we abide in him, and as we take one day at a time in light of the brilliant and bright future that lies ahead. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have good things in store for your people, that you are coming back, that you will take us to be with yourself, and that we will be able, after a seven-year awesome period of judgment upon this earth and the outpouring of your wrath, we will be able to experience life on earth as it was meant to be lived. We will experience dominion over the planet which you gave to mankind initially, but allowed the evil one to hold sway with great darkness and deception. Now, Lord, may we be faithful and abide in you. Thank you for your promises. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. See you again soon. First John 2, 20. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming.